Well, welcome to this Tuesday session of Insider Secrets. And you know that's brought to you by My Core Intentions. Before I introduce today's guest, let me mention a couple things about My Core Intentions. You know, we are designed to deliver proven real estate real estate strategies through our personalized coaching programs to help facilitate a positive life change for our clients. We do this by delivering proven strategies um, on multifamily investing, on real estate investing, on property management, things that are going to help you grow your business, grow your knowledge. One thing I always tell people is, you know what, the smarter we get, the easier things become for us or the more that we can do. And I like the fact that we just continue to deliver information that's going to help your business grow. So if you're considering a coach or if you're considering some training strategies, give us a call. Go to our website. You can sign up for a free coaching session and we'll get you some information. Actually, on my website today, I'm offering a free handout, seven steps to a quick multifamily acquisition. You can go there and download that for free. But I am joined today by my good friend and property manager from the Washington, D.C. area, Dale Nesbaum. Dale and his family actually live in Gainesville, Virginia. Uh, Dale's a seasoned real estate professional with uh, a formula for property management that really works. And one of the things, Dale, that I really like about Dale is he gives back. He's got a service mentality and a service uh, attitude to his clients. So we're going to have Dale share his backstory with us and uh, how he got into the business. Um, and Dale, why don't you just go ahead and introduce yourself right now. And one thing that I want to know is why don't you tell the listeners one word that best describes you and your strategy for property management? I would say the one word that best describes me is communication. Uh, that is one of the uh, most important aspects of the job, always being in touch with the people that we are responsible to and the ones that we serve. Yeah, communication is so important for everybody, right? I always tell people that, you know what, when I rent to somebody, I make sure that, you know what, if, something, if there's a problem with your rent, if there's a leaky faucet, make sure you communicate with us and let us know. Absolutely. So, so Dale, why don't you take a few minutes here and explain to us how you got into the property management business? Certainly. So I graduated from Northern Illinois University in 1973 with a degree in education at the time. Um, and at that time, uh, there was a, a glut in the teaching market and I found myself competing for jobs with other seasoned teachers. Uh, so I, thought I would temporarily step aside and work in the property management industry until a position might open up. Well, truth be told, I immediately got hooked and I never looked back. Uh, eventually, I took some property management courses uh, through the Institute of Real Estate Management and I earned my certified property manager designation. Uh, that was in 1976. And as an aside, I, I uh, served in 1995 as president of the Institute of Real Estate Management Chicago chapter, which was at that time the largest chapter in the world. I was also able to make lifelong friendships with many property managers along the way. Mm. Interesting. You know, it's kind of funny, it, you, you know, you, you graduate from college with a degree in teaching and kind of fall into real estate. I, I think a lot of people decide, you know, ultimately fall into real estate, like it might be a good thing to do for a while and just kind of see how it goes. And I think real estate's always one of those industries that just kind of hooks people and pulls people in and has people, you know, uh, stay pretty committed for a long period of time, right? Yes. So uh, how's your experience been over the years? I mean, has it been one that's always been pleasurable or have you found struggles along the way? I think with any career, any job, there's always struggles. And, you know, you, you just, you need to be able to sort that out and, and just work the best you can, do your job and, and try to find ways to enjoy it along the way. Um, one of the things that I always found rewarding is the fact that in the property management industry, there is never, ever one day that's the same. 
Mm. You know, you're not sitting there at a, a, a punch press, you know, doing the same thing day in and day out. Um, you're dealing with people. And anytime you deal with people, uh, just hang on because uh, there's always something in it that's going to uh, keep you going. It's kind of crazy because people always say, hey, how come you like real estate so much? Why are you, uh, you know, why are you so passionate about it? You know, they say we should be passionate about what we do, right? Well, I'm passionate about it because it's never the same. Well, you, can close, right. you can close 100 deals and they're never the same. You can Absolutely. manage different properties and have different responsibilities and relationships and they're just never the same. And there's always something to learn. So I know over the years you've worked for uh, and alongside several different property management companies. Um, are there are there any of those situations that that really stick out to you, or any stories that that really stick out that you know really made that experience worthwhile? Well, honestly, uh, no stories come to mind. Although um, I'm sure there are where, there are some. Uh, but in my 47 year career, Michael, um, I, I worked in three property management companies. And the first company that I worked for was a full service real estate firm. Uh, they provided services for commercial, industrial, apartments, mm -hmm. and condominium associations. And it definitely gave me a balanced perspective on, on all the major property types. Uh, that job, by the way, lasted for 37 years. And uh, I also became a partner in that firm along the way. The second company only managed condominium and townhome associations, which by the way is my favorite form of property to manage. Uh, we had a staff of 50 and we managed over 18,000 units at the time. That was all in the Chicagoland area. Uh, then last year, uh, last July, uh, my wife and I moved to uh, Northern Virginia from Illinois and we, uh, we have really enjoyed it. Uh, I love the climate change in particular. Um, but um, I also was uh, fortunate uh, through some context that I had developed over the years to receive an assignment to manage a 2,800 unit homeowner association in Ashburn, Virginia. I, um, I oversee a staff of seven and I, I actually am able to do this on a part-time basis largely because of the strength of my staff. Uh, so I, all three firms were privately held, um, meaning that they were owned by usually no more than two individuals. And I never really had the opportunity to, to work in the, uh, the, the corporate field. Um, you know, the uh, smaller privately held firms are typically um, smaller companies in size. Uh, they have a, generally a more relaxed environment uh, to work within. Uh, it's easier to navigate. And if you perform well, uh, promotions are easier to obtain. Oh. And uh, so that's just a little bit about my, my past history. So that's interesting. You know, you talked about that one company you worked for that you kind of managed across the board different types of products. You know, and I always, you know, for purpose of, of this call, really, we're talking about multifamily, right? This is, um, I, I coach and train multifamily real estate investors, but we always look at, at those product classes as different, right? So you got office, you have industrial, you have residential, and then you have residential multifamily. But the big thing, the HOAs, right? That's where you seem to have spent, or what you have said that you like the most. But can you talk about some distinct differences just between the multifamily residential and the HOAs and the associations, uh, those types of situations? Well, in general, um, with, uh, with multifamily residential, with uh, apartment rentals, for example, uh, these are, are typically situations where you are dealing with an owner of a property and you, and it's a team. It's a team effort. You know, you're, you're fulfilling the, uh, the roles and the obligations and fulfilling the objectives of, the, of your client. A uh, little bit different with homeowners associations. You are not only the manager, but you're also dealing with a board of directors that is typically comprised of anything from uh, three to maybe as many as 10 individuals. So there's a lot of politics involved, at least that's what I have found over the years, managing HOAs. 
uh, you have so many fingers in the pie and, and oftentimes decisions become delayed for a, a period of time or issues uh, get, you know, the, the can gets kicked down the street, so to speak, um, versus working with, a, uh, with an owner of a, an apartment building. Uh, you know, those, those decisions usually come about quickly and you can act, you can act and uh, uh, fulfill the, uh, the objectives of your client a lot easier. Yeah, you know, what's interesting is you get around those boards and you've got seven or eight people, maybe 10 people that all have to come together and make a decision. I think what it really does is it really brings out your leadership skills, your ability to sell those people on where they need to go. Because really, you're the brains, right? You're the guy who knows the answer and what they should choose to do uh, in a particular situation. But, but now you have to really kind of sell them or lead them to that right answer. Yeah. Talk about, you know, how that's worked for you over the years. Yeah, you, you have to be able to communicate well. Uh, there, there's no question about it. You have to be that salesperson because mm. uh, oftentimes, uh, you, especially in homeowner associations, you have individuals that have worked in all sorts of different um, environments throughout their life. You know, some are doctors, some are, have been uh, CEOs, some just worked in, uh, uh, in the retail industry. And, and so they, they come with a different set of, of core values and thoughts and ideas. Uh, many of them all of a sudden get onto the internet, they become experts. Uh, but um, but you, you need to be able to, to hone in on, on the, uh, the problem at hand, to be able to explain uh, to your board, uh, to those owners, exactly what needs to be done and, and try to take the lead the best you can. It's not always easy because you work for them. But I think though that if, if, if you uh, are successful some, several times, uh, they will recognize that and, and they will, uh, you know, they'll, they'll appreciate the leadership standpoint that, uh, that you take on. Yeah, yeah, good, good. Um, so what do you think has been one of the biggest shaping uh, moments in of your career around property management? Well, Mike, I would say that it was when I was first given the opportunity to manage others. Hmm. You know, it's one thing if you're responsible for your own decisions and actions and an entirely whole set of different matters when you're responsible for the actions or the inactions of others. And uh, you know, your success depends largely upon the team that you are working with, the team that you're supervising and those that report to you. Uh, you need to be able to, to lead, you need to be able to mentor, you need to be able to encourage, to discipline those people that you are ultimately responsible for. Yeah, leadership is a big part in, in, in anything that we're trying to be successful in, right? So you have to be able to lead those people um, and I think what really makes a really good leader over time is a leader that can develop other leaders. And I know that you have the ability to do that in your staff and, and you've run some pretty big staffs. I think that at one point you were running a, um, a division that had about 24,000 units that you guys managed, didn't you? Yes, that's correct. So we had a staff of 50 that I, uh, uh, I worked with. We had about 20, 27 managers and the rest were all support people. Uh, accounting and, and clerical and whatnot. So, yeah. So, you know, it's, sometimes it's like wearing a lot of different hats, isn't it? So, yes. you know, we have to instill that leadership in other people. It was quite a challenge. Um, will yes. you, you know, as a property manager, will you work with real estate investors that have multifamily products that they have, that they want to um, uh, have a third party company manage? Yeah, so um, in my present uh, situation, you know, I, um, I, I'm, I'm not really truly available for that, uh, uh, for that role, but I, in the, in the past, you know, I absolutely would work with, uh, uh, with many investors, um, as long as I know that their objectives are reasonable and attainable, because if they're not, I think it's a recipe for disaster then. You know, if you, if you have a client that, that has, Un, um, unusual expectations. Um, you know, you're going to increase rents 5% a year regardless, or um, 
you know, you're, you're going to uh, prolong certain um, amenities or repairs that need to be made, uh, you know, just for the benefit of putting money in, into the client's pockets. It's, it's not workable. Yeah. Okay. So you, you, you need to be able to do something that's going to benefit both parties. You, I know you've always come from a place of win-win, right? If we can't, absolutely. if everybody can't win, it's not worth uh, pursuing. That's right. What do you think makes your personal strategy unique and set apart from other property managers in the market? So my strategy uh, consists of setting goals, communicating with my clients. As I said earlier, communication is key. Um, working you know, closely with the customers that we serve and, uh, and, and certainly to pay attention to details. Mm. Uh, I've always believed that, that the devil is in the details. Uh, if you fail to cross every T or uh, dot every I, you will most certainly fail. Yeah. And that's, a, that's an interesting comment, you know, that a lot of times we can get lost and bury our head in the sand somewhere else when, when really if we pay attention to the little details, those are the things that'll generally bring a property, turn a property around. You know, Absolutely. Um, uh, I've talked to um, other real estate investors that, you know, say, well, what can I do different? And, and I've talked to them about paying attention to the small things along the way. And, yes. and that just makes a lot of sense. So, so we're in the midst of this coronavirus or hopefully getting close to the end of, of this season that we're in. Um, what, what rules of the game have changed uh, in your perspective since this since pre coronavirus to where we're at today and and you know i'd add a part to that where do you see it going in the next six months 12 months very good question you know i i, I am a people person property management is a face-to-face -face business like it or not it's very personal always has been at least for me um, eye to eye communications and handshakes have always been an integral part of conducting business. Uh, not everything that we can do uh, can be handled on the phone, via email, or even in Zoom meetings for that matter. Uh, you know, at, at, at least it's not done as effective as when you are doing it on a personal level. That's yeah. what I have. We've been doing a lot more Zoom meetings today. I know some, in, I yes. know some investors that are even looking at properties virtually, right? They, yes. Brokers are walking around showing different things with rooms and, and that. And, yep. Even our covenants inspectors here on our association, you know, we are, we're doing inspections um, with Zoom. You know, we are, we are just conducting it that way. We're not involving people in the process. So we're just doing our, our physical inspections that way. And then, and then uh, sending it on to the, uh, the rightful parties. So do you see this as being a new norm in any way? <laughs> um, you know, Mike, I, I do, at least for now. I, I, I truly do. Um, I, I hate that term, to be very honest, the new norm. But it, frankly, that's what we're living in now. That's, that's the period, that's the history, that's the period of time we are now in. Um, in many ways, it's going to stay that way. Um, but I do believe that as time goes by and, and communities begin to open up once again, uh, I think we're going to be able to, to experience that face-to-face that, that -face communication and that personal touch. Uh, it's going to take a while, but, but I think that it's going to happen. I, 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 I don't see that, uh, that we can continue um, only managing properties, uh, you know, through electronic methods. Yeah. So, you know, what's interesting is I'm a hugger, right? So yeah. I, you, you live in Virginia, but I know you're going to come back to Chicago and visit. And when I see you, I'm not wearing a mask and just shaking your hand or bumping your elbow. I want a hug, you know? Absolutely. You'll and, get one. And that's how, how, so I don't see how we can as a society, you know, continue uh, as we are. So I think things are going to change and, you know, rightfully so, right? We need to get back to some normal normalcy. You know, I remember when uh, people thought that technology would take over selling cars and selling houses and, and selling all these different things, when in reality, we're, we're a society of touch and smell and feel, right? So we need to right. 
you can't do everything virtually. I think that you need to be able to, to physically touch, you know, the doorknob and touch the window and see how it opens and things like that. That's right. Um, how long, you know, and this might be a loaded question or, uh, you know, a question not really any of us have an idea about, but how long do you think before we, we go back in the other direction? Well, this is just my personal view only, but I would say somewhere within the next six month period. That's my best guess. Okay. That's my um, best guess. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's nice things are starting to open up again. How about now, now you're managing homeowners associations today again, right? And yes. in the midst of that, I imagine you don't have a lot, you don't have a rental section per se in those. No. It's all homeowners, right? Correct. So do you feel that the homeowner today is, is demanding or are they more tolerant to uh, the way the market is and what they demand of you as a property manager? Yes, um, they, they certainly are demanding. There's no question. You know, you have to consider, though, that these are, these are folks that, that live in what is probably their, their single largest investment, their, their personal home, whether it is a condominium. And we have all forms here. We have condominiums, single family homes, uh, townhomes, and carriage homes. And, you know, they, these are folks that have worked hard, are still, many of them are still working hard, and they have properties that they want maintained. And, and the homeowner association is responsible for the care and maintenance of the surroundings of, of their property, the common areas, so to speak. And, and so, yes, they, they, uh, we have found that they, they are quite demanding. And even more so now that many of them have been, have been staying at home or working from home, you know, they're, it's one thing if, if they leave the home for the day and they're gone for their 9, 10, 12 hours and they come back, they're tired. Last thing they want to do is call the management company. Well, now they've got lots of time on their hands and they're, they're thinking of all those little things that they saw before or, or they catch as they're walking out their home. And, and uh, so, yeah, they're, they're constantly in touch with us. We, we get hundreds of emails every day. Yeah. Is that your best source of communication is by email or do you get a lot of phone calls? We get a small percentage of phone calls, but mostly email. Okay. Yeah. So can you talk about, a, about some of the differences between HOA and multi, you know, just standard multifamily rental? What would be some of the management differences uh, between those two types of things, something you would do differently. You know, one thing we've already talked about, right, is you don't have tenants, so you're not leasing apartments. You already, you have people who own those units. True. And, and so, you know, you're not collecting rents. When you're managing a, a, an association or, a, or an HOA, uh, you're, you're not collecting rents. Um, you are typically more in tune with the budgetary process, um, utilize a, 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 the budget method, but, but largely with the HOAs, I mean, that, that's what you live and die by. And you, and you will typically have one or two members on the board that are always watching the nickels mm -hmm. and questioning, why do we spend this on that? And uh, can't we cut back on this? And so, um, so largely the, um, you know, the economic, um, the, the operations, the spending of the money piece is extremely important with HOAs. So mm -hmm. as, as a manager, you, um, you're responsible for all of the things that go on around that property. Everything from landscaping, in some areas you'll have snow removal as part of that landscaping, exterior maintenance on buildings, right? Roofs and siding. And yes, for the for the uh, multi-unit buildings, correct. Sure, um, and then you know, then you have uh, things outside the gate, right? So you're going to have curb appeal and fences, <clears throat> situations like that. Can you talk to some of those a little bit more? You know, um, I think that we have a lot of listeners on the call today that are going to that really focus on multifamily. And they know what some of those tasks are. 
So being a little bit, you know, just showing that difference even further between the two asset classes. Well, certainly curb appeal. I mean, in a way, both both asset classes have to make use of, of that. Um, but I, I do believe, though, that uh, that is even more important, at least this is my opinion, more important for the homeowner associations to hone in on on curb appeal. You know, these are these are areas where people they have their they have guests that come. They, they want to show off their home. They want to show off the, the community that they live in. And so we, you know, we are constantly surveying the property, driving around the property, looking for ways in which we can um, make it more appealing for both guests and, and prospective new buyers as well. So there's parking lots that you oversee and striping of those yep. lots and maybe... Yep where the garbage facility is, the, the fencing around those to, you know, beautify the property a little bit and um, swimming pools, tennis courts, those types of things all need to be looked after. So you, you really have a, a lot of responsibility. There's a lot of overlap between the two asset classes, but, but there really is a lot of responsibility on, on the property manager to oversee all those different aspects. That is correct. So, so really the only thing that's, that's missing in that asset class is the uh, tenant. But here's what I equate is you have a board that you deal with that typically in a multifamily, you wouldn't have a board. Right. So there's kind of a trade off there because you still have that one piece where you're going to deal with people and have to give them a little bit more. Yes. Well, that's for so. sure, Mike. So Dale, you know, what is, what do you see moving forward for yourself, uh, for your own career, for the property management industry? What do you, what do you see moving forward over the next couple of years? Well, as I mentioned earlier, it's been 47 years now. At some point in time, I need to, I need to hang up my spurs. Uh, at least that's what my wife keeps telling me. So, um, but I, but I love the challenge. And, you know, just getting up every day. And, and like I said earlier, you know, n not one day is, is, uh, is the same. Uh, so, um, so as time goes on over the next several years, I'm going to be looking for ways in which I can step back a bit, um, perhaps do some more consulting instead of, you know, hands-on property management. Um, th that I could find very interesting. Um, and for what... What's happening going forward with uh, with property management? You know, in in all these years, um, the one thing that seems to me that has remained remained the same, and I think is going to continue to remain the same, um, is that the relationships that we develop amongst ourselves, with our teams, uh, with our contacts, you know, are not going to change. You know, we're going to have we're going to have ways in which we can continue to network with one another, uh, joining certain associations. You know, like I say, relying on people like you for uh, you know for knowledge. Uh, there's so many associations out there too that uh, that people can join and become uh, integral parts of. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, from from not you know not just the followers but the leaders eventually as well. Yeah, networking is a big piece, isn't it? It certainly is. So what advice would you give a new agent or a new investor today coming into the marketplace? What advice would you give someone today? Well, just um, not to repeat what I just said, but really to network. And, and I'm going to say that three times. Network, network, network. It's so important. Um, you know, joining associations like the Institute of Real Estate Management, like the Community Association Institute, BOMA, a BOMA. I mean, it, that's just to name a few, but it's so important to, to rub shoulders with other property managers, leaders of other, of other companies as well, uh, to, to develop relationships along the way. Uh, that, that's where you're going to obtain opportunities for employment. Yeah. And, um, and, and as for investors, you know, I say that it's, it's crucial that they, they need to interview 
If they're going to plan to work with a property management company, they need to interview three property management firms. Uh, they need to thoroughly check out their references and their track record uh, before signing any contracts. Uh, and always make sure that they interview the property manager that they're going to deal with. Mm -hmm. Because you can't always, as much as property management firms want to say, we will provide the property manager, you know, the investor needs to know that, that that relationship is going to work or not. So they have to have the ability to interview that, that individual. Sure, sure. Yeah, that's very true. Well, one thing I always teach my, my coaching clients is to network. And I think networking is really important because it's about building a team. It's about building those people around you who are a lot smarter than you. Um, and you, you kind of follow the smart people, right? In yeah. order for us to be more successful, we want to educate ourselves a little bit more, become a little bit smarter and follow those smart, successful people. That's right. So Dale, so if we had an investor who was um, out in your neck of the woods looking for some uh, consulting or some, you know, knowledge and they wanted to get a hold of you, how would they go about getting a hold of you today? Certainly. So I'm easy to reach. Yep. My, it's my first and last name, Dale Nussbaum at gmail.com. And we will make sure that on our uh, website that we have your contact information and how people can get a hold of you if anybody's got questions or they want to chat with you a little bit. I want to thank you for your time today. Uh, it's been very helpful and informative. And you know, I've e even opened my eyes to a couple of things and made me rethink a couple of things here quickly. So there you know go. that uh, property management is an integral part of the investing business whether you're doing it yourself or having somebody else. And it's just good to know somebody else in the business. So yep. I want to thank you for being here today and you want to say goodbye. And Michael, thank you for having me. Yeah, you bet. And you have a great day. And uh, remember, you can listen to this recording again at mycoreintentions.com and uh, download any of those handouts today. And we'll look forward to talking to you all soon. Thank you and have a great day. Bye now.